Hello, good evening. If you're joining us live from the UK, and a very warm welcome to the second of our Welfare Wednesday webinars of 2021. It's great to have you along. You are joining us by Zoom, and we just have to mark time if you've been with us before, before we uh, welcome everyone who's joining us by Facebook. But as hopefully you know, but if you haven't joined us before and you're on Zoom, it's great news because we've got a couple of poll questions during the course of the evening and it would be great to get you involved in that there's they're not a test they're just to get a feel for who's out there and who's joining us uh, for for the webinar this evening we've tried to cover so much different sort of topics during these webinars um, and as I'll repeat later on if you've got ideas that we might be able to utilize for future webinars please let us know by emailing us on education at Wellforce welfare Dot org. And a very warm welcome to everyone who's just joining us on Facebook Live for today's Welfare Wednesday webinar. On a day when, if you're joining us from the UK, only an hour ago, the nation uh, collectively clapped for Captain Sir Tom Moore. What an inspiration he is. And I was thinking of some quotes that he came in. These are tough times for so many people. And his, his quote from last year, for all those finding it difficult, the sun will shine on you again and the clouds will go away. Amen to that, and God bless Captain Tom for the inspiration that he has provided to us. But of course, this evening, it, we're here to talk about issues that challenge us and, and also issues that can help us as horse owners. And I'm delighted to welcome Joe Paul, a chartered phys physiotherapist who has had a long association uh, and is a huge friend of World Horse Welfare. And also welcome back our um, farm manager from our Aberdeenshire Rescue and Rehoming Centre, Eileen Crudden. And it's great to have them both with us, um, but we very much want you to be involved in this evening as well. So please do, uh, we have two presentations from Joe and Eileen, and then we'll have a chance for Q&A. So please do, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, then please use the comments function. If you're joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function. That would be great. If you're joining us by Facebook Live, please do share the live video. And tonight's video uh, webinar is being being um, recorded and will be available um, afterwards on our YouTube channel and all our previous webinars are there. Tonight's uh, work uh, webinar on groundwork will be there as long as all the others and if you would like a topic included in future webinars then please do let us know by emailing us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org and just to let you know in two weeks time our next webinar is features Mark Todd and Pippa Funnel and preparing your horse for competition in this the most extraordinary of seasons. Now before we go any further I'm going to share my screen. Um, hopefully this will be a, uh, a simple job. There we go. Um, and then so building strength through groundwork that's the, the, the um, topic of this evening's webinar. Um, um, try and get it to move forward. We just want to get you involved in a poll. So if you're joining us by Zoom, you'll be able to get to, to answer this. But And if you're joining us by Facebook Live, unfortunately you can't. So please do next time, do register on Zoom and you will be able to. No right or wrong answer. Just want to get a feel. Do you work your horse from the ground in hand lunging or long reining at least once a week? Simple. Um, first time ever. We've given you a yes or no answer. Uh, no other options are available. Um, so before, whilst you uh, consider that, I, I just want to tell you a, a little bit about World Horse Welfare, um, if I can move the slide on. Um, and it's a charity that was built on supporting the horse-human partnership. And we do this in so many ways, and we do it across the world in Europe and in uh, 16 countries across low and middle income countries across the globe. And part of our work is around caring. And in the UK, we have four rescue and rehoming centres. As I mentioned earlier, Eileen is one uh, of uh, is the centre manager of our farm in Scotland in a Boyne Belwade farm. And just to give you a feel, we normally care for over 350 horses at any one time. And last year, Belwade brought in over 100 horses, 108 horses in 2020, and rehomed 89. Uh, collectively, the charity rehomed 356 over the course of the year, which was a record. So um, rehomers play such an important part in the work that we do. But also education is a really important aspect of what we do in partnership with many other organisations. And as I mentioned, these webinars are here to help us as horse owners. And tonight, it's all about groundwork. And groundwork 
encompasses any time we spend with our horses when we're not riding or driving them. And it includes everything from day-to-day -day handling to Capriol and everything in between. And it's associated with a wide range of benefits that I hope will come really obvious tonight. Now, before I hand over to Joe, I want to uh, find out from Basil just where we got to with the poll. And there you go. So three quarters of us have or do uh, work our horse on the ground once a week, at least once a week, a quarter of us don't. It would be interesting uh, in a few months time, having heard tonight's uh, webinar, whether that, it, that, that those numbers will change. But thank you very much for taking part in that. So now I'm delighted to introduce you to to Joe Paul, who, as I said, is a chartered physiotherapist and a great friend at a charity. She runs, uh, works in East Lothian uh, at Woolens Equine Rehabilitation Centre Practice and provides clinical education for physiotherapy MSc undergraduates um, and delivers postgraduate courses and lectures on whole horse rehabilitation worldwide. And together with Eileen, that whole horse rehabilitation concept is something that has served World Horse Welfare well for so, so long. One quirky fact about Joe, you possibly didn't know, she has become a rock chick because she, following her son's band, Never Now, and she, she's gone as a, a, a rock chick to some of the dodgiest venues in <laughs> Maybe we, if we have time, we can find out which was the dodgiest venue in Scotland. But Joe, over to you. Thank you, Rowley, and thank you so much to World Horse Welfare for asking me to come along and speak about groundwork. I spend most of my life doing groundwork with horses, so it's great to come and speak to you. The, gosh, it's a huge subject, absolutely enormous, and um, so my aim tonight is to try and empower those of you that don't think that you've got the skills to do groundwork to get started and those of you that incorporate groundwork in your training maybe give you some insights into the therapeutic handling side because obviously I'm coming from the rehab hub side um, and there's a few dodgy tricks that we we use with the rehab horses that maybe would be useful for you to join up with your normal training groundwork. So as Rowley said, what is, you know, groundwork is, is anything you do that's not riding or driving your horse. Anything when you're on the ground and you're with your horse. So that's nice and easy. General day-to-day -day handling, working in hand, which can be leading in and out from the field, um, long reining, and all the way up to the wonderful um, dressage horses that you see being worked in, in, in the lot on long reins. Joe, do you want to share your screen? I, I will do. I was just, yeah. All right. There. Have we got the, everybody now? You're good to go. Yeah, good to go. Right. So, when is groundwork useful? Well, mainly we do groundwork in all of the cases so that you can optimize your horse's movement patterns. And once these movement patterns are correct and efficient, then he will strengthen so much better. So all of the exercises that you're doing are going to work, work better and strengthen them more. So if you're strengthening a horse that is using poor and suboptimal um, movement patterns, all you're really doing is, is strengthening the wrong movement pattern. So, Everything we do with them is towards moving in the correct movement pattern so he can strengthen at whatever level you want to work him at, whether you're working him as a, to be a hacking pony or whether you're working for um, the high level dressage event horses, they all have to work in the correct movement patterns to be able to strengthen into the, the, um, for, for the job that you're trying to do with them. But let's just think about the very basic of where we're going to handle a horse. We want to have him moving efficiently so that we can improve his balance. If his balance is good, his manners will be better. He will be easier and safer and much more pleasant to work with. And that's going to improve your confidence if you have not done an awful lot of groundwork, an awful lot of handling. So when else would we use them? Well, let's start at the very beginning. If we use a um, box rest and working with them in the stable, 
things like just grooming, placing his feet, picking his feet up, all of these things, if we are asking him to do them in correct movement pattern, we're giving time to think, then it's going to make it much more pleasant to, to work with that horse. So we're going to improve our confidence. Leading, leading in and out from the field. If he's working in his own space, he's improving his body awareness, he's, he's going to be much happier, much safer, much more relaxed to walk in and out and a, pl a pleasure to handle. All the way through to long reining and lunging, which are more, um, if you were trying to, to strengthen the movement pattern, increase the stamina, etc. Then, um, then lunging is, is a great idea. And also when you're long reining to get them out and about to see things around. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. General fitting work. If you have um, found that you either not got the time, you're waiting for a saddle to arrive, or maybe you're, you've been ill or you've an injury, then sometimes just being on the ground is, is a good idea and enables you to keep the horse ticking over and keep them working so as that you can um, be ready to go when you are ready to ride. The, one of the times I find it really useful is um, with the young horses and weak horses especially because what you can do is you can do groundwork for maybe part of the session as a warm up, and then you can do your ridden work and then maybe for maybe 10, 15 minutes and then get off and do your cool down groundwork. And that will reestablish the movement patterns that you're trying to adopt. And he will keep these movement patterns for the next 23 hours until you ride them again. So interspersing the ridden work with your, your groundwork, whether it's um, a weekly event or or whether you're actually interspersing it within one session. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I got lost there. Um, yeah, the other thing is if you are working your horse and he's had an injury, for instance, and he's been had gastric ulcers or he's had um, tack that hasn't fitted, sometimes just working him with that tack will improve his confidence that actually that's not going to be a bother. Um, and then right through to the ridden work, if you think about the um, your rider who has been ill or has been injured, remember even an experienced rider that has is catching it, is holding an injury and blocking the horse's movement will um, will probably be better doing groundwork rather than sitting the ho on the horse until they, they feel that they're, they're ready to go again. So what tips um, can we actually take from the therapeutic handling side of, of um, groundwork and apply them to all horses? Well, the first thing we want to um, are you to do as a handler is be confident about where where you're going when you actually move the um, horse. Hold on, sorry, Basil. I'm trying to. Ah, here we go. So, when you're doing any sort of leading or um, working your horse on on um, long reins or on a lunge rein as, as we're doing here, then make sure that you are um, pointing your pelvis in the direction you want to go in, because that's going to give a horse the verbal cues or the body cues that actually um, you need where, where you're going. And so he's, he's going to be going in that direction too. Also, you want to make sure that you are in balance. A handler that's in balance is just about as bad as a rider that's in balance because if you're actually holding on to the horses, um, if you're holding on to the horses head and he's having to lean on you to to keep your balance then he's going to lose his balance as well so be very careful to um always have um yourself in balance and if you want to to stop then try practicing half halting and then stopping very definitely 
And so you can see in, in your balance whilst you're, um, whilst you're working with him. Now, the other thing that is very important when we're working with these horses, and I find a useful thing to do, is what I call bubble work. Now, bubble work is what you're seeing here on the slide. And what is happening here is that I'm in my bubble, he's in his bubble. And what I'm trying to do is work so that I can actually see him and see where he is losing his strength or, or losing his straightness, whether he's falling in through his shoulder, whether he's falling in through his ribs. And what I want to do is my bubble is at the end of my stick. And you can see here that the bubble at the end of the stick is pointing to the shoulder. Now, that stick should not make contact with the horse at all unless he falls in with his shoulder. If he falls in with the shoulder, the stick will be there to prompt him to utilize the muscles to straighten the shoulder up. Now, if I want the horse to walk forward, I'll take the stick up and underneath them because what we really want to do when we're starting um, moving our, ho our horses to move is that they start by releasing their back and lifting their abdominals so that they can step under with that hind leg. The other thing we want to try and do is try and teach the horse that when that stick goes in front of them, i.e. the bubble goes in front of them, then he either slows down or he stops. If, and so in that way, we don't have to hold on to the head or pull on the head at all whilst we're asking him to, to slow down. It's merely a case of taking the stick to the front of him and asking him to um, stop behind the bubble that the this, this stick makes. If he find that he's not going to do that for you, then one of the things you can do is very slowly walk him toward a wall and then and using your voice, say woe and woe and woe, and see if he will stop very calmly, very quietly at the wall. Now, the reason that I would use that strategy is that he is then using his own body awareness, his own balance to, um, to stop. And he'll learn if you take him back round and, and repeat that process, then you can start asking him to slow down um, further and further away from that wall and until he is stopping himself in, in, in his own balance um, away from the wall. So that's quite a nice little, little tip to use. The other thing, if we can have the next slide, is if you're trying to work on your horse's straightness, then use the, the wall or the fence of, the, the, of your school to um, do your transitions, walk them along, do your transitions to keep them straight. And then as you progress, you can walk the horse further and further away from the wall. So you're actually improving the straightness um, without him hugging the side, the side of the stool. And you can see here, I'm still using, using the, bubble, the, the bubble work as we're going along. From the slides, you can probably see that I've just got a cavison on and a lunge rein. This is something that I do regularly and very rarely do I have to use any more restraint. You have to use the tack, of course, that you feel safe with, but um, you need to be able to um, al allow him to move and not have any of the, the tack restricting him. Now, we've gone on to this, this slide, and one of the things that you want to look at when you're doing your, when you're doing your groundwork is let's consider what actually is going to help the horse most. Now, if we think about the, um, the posture of the horse, that will give us an indication as to wh how, what's the best way to, to work on. Now, the posture that your horse adopts is a map of the history of how he's moved. And very often through maybe problems with training, problems with confirmation, problems with shoeing, then the horse will have adopted some form of posture. Now, the posture really come in about three different um, types. And um, depending on which type your horse is, will will dictate what would be the best way to, 
to, to work with them. Now, this is a sway back posture, and these horses very definitely, the traditional long and low work that we do with them, um, trying to get them to step under is a great idea. We need the abdominals to work with this type of horse. Now, the next type would be what I call a straight back or a herring gutted horse. Now, this horse, there is no way you want to do long and low because if you have a look at these abdominal muscles, then they're already absolutely locked on. So to ask him to lift them some more, to lift these back, is really going to be counterproductive. So what we would do with this horse, or what I would advise to do with this horse, is to work very much on the lateral bend first before then working on the, um, the, the rest of the range in, the, in, in, in his back. Now, the next horse would be an, what I would call a s bat horse. And this me, these horses are very poorly muscled at the back end. Now, the temptation with this horse is to send them trotting up and down hills. Um, and the problem with that is you probably knock him lame because he's obviously weak there because there is some form of problem. So what we would really like, what we find works with these horses really well is to get, mobilize the thoracic sling and what's happening in front so as that there's no block to the movement and then very, very slowly work on the... Um, on the building up of his back end. So that can be um, pole work, lunging, long reining up and down hills. But this type of horse, it's very delicate. So you want to try and make sure that the, the work that you do with him would be quite slow um, and, and, and um, not instantly going into building up that back end. Now, when we, the next thing we want to be doing is trying to consider the training stage that your horse is at when you're doing your groundwork. So one of the big tips that I, I use with, with the students that come, the physio students, is that we always want to plan our session. Now, it sounds very simple, but actually try and think, what am I actually going to go out and do with this horse today? Is it transitions I want to work on? Is it straightness I want to work on? Is it um, walking over poles? Even is it going near a scary flag? Make sure that you've actually got a plan, you know what you want to achieve. You go out and you try and make sure that you have it's a fair question. Have you actually built the horse up to the point where he can actually do what you want him to do? Now, this wouldn't really matter whether you were um, doing work in, in hand, um, the bubble work leading him about, or whether you were lunging, or whether you're long reining. But sometimes I go into a yard and I'll see horses just galloping around on a lunge, and you say, what, what is actually going on with this? Oh, well, he's letting off steam. Well, he's got 23 hours in the field to let off steam. When he's working, he should be working. So I would think that galloping around even for five, five minutes at the beginning of lunch session is at um, and very least dangerous. So this is where he'll quite um, possibly injure himself. But also I think when he goes to do a lunch session or an enhanced session, he should know that that's his work and that's what he's doing. So if you are working with your horse, try and make him work from the start of your session, try and achieve your, your goal for that session. And I would urge you if you're actually supervising people that are working horses on your yard to do the same, even as a CPD exercise, ask them what the, their aim is for that session and for every session. Now, if you um, fatigue a horse with groundwork, then what probably what will happen is that he will deteriorate in the performance level. So you might find he starts knocking poles, he might find he starts behaving a bit um, less well. So one of the things that I would always do is think about um, if that's happened, if he's had a good session and, and I've maybe over it a little bit and he starts deteriorating, then make the question easier and end on a good note. Come back the next time and you know exactly 
where you've had to stop. You learn where he fatigues. And try and record that. Make a record of, of how long you managed to work him in hand before he fatigued. Because don't make any mistake, working in hand is difficult mentally for them. They're having to learn movement patterns. They're having to um, think about every step. And it's a bit like you riding a dressers test and having to think about every stride and where you're going to do your half halts and where you're going to do. And they do get mentally tired. So I would think probably about 30 minutes is well enough and sometimes with younger or weaker horses less we've worked horses on the ground for maybe five minutes and found they fatigued and sometimes when we had the rehab horses here we would take them out two or three times in a day and just do a five minute session it is quite difficult but again don't worry if you get over egg it you can always just make the question easier, but really don't try and go on and on and on until you, um, you to try and improve, improve things. So these are these, um, the, the type of horses and what you would want to, um, what uh, you would like to do with, with the different types and that will make your work time far more efficient. So let's go on to a few exercises that we can actually do. Um, I would like you just to think for the next couple of minutes, which route would your horse take over this pole? Would he go the, the green path, the yellow path or the red path? Just think about that for a second. And whilst you're thinking about that, what um, the other the exercises that I think are really useful when you've got a horse that's on, on box rest are your bribe stretches, placing the horse's foot. So um, I call it quadrant stretches, but basically you take one foot and put it in front of the other or one foot and put it behind the other one. Um, the other thing you can do is um, rock the horse side to side through his, through his front legs, rock weight transfer and rock the horse side to side through his back legs, rock him from his front legs to his back and back legs to his front. All of these are movement patterns that he has to use when he's out and about. So if we're thinking about um, maintaining the movement patterns for horses, when they're on box rest, then these are all things that, that are, are really useful and, and very easy to do. And if you think about it, if you place one hind foot in front of the other hind foot, that's the start of the movement pattern to ask your horse to move over. And if he learns to move over and you um, give him time to absorb that, um, that request, so then then he learns that he can step under, he can cross over. Now you can use that exercise um, when you take him out in the school for doing small circles or when you want to walk him over the poles. It's the same movement pattern, just you slightly increase the difficulty of the functions as you go along. Just before we come back to the pole work here, the next stage would be working in hand and the bubble work really is useful and I would encourage you to play with that. You can't do your horse any harm doing with it and don't underestimate the time that you spend with your horse. Just, just walking him about, just leading him around. You um, learn each other's language, you learn each other's moods and it's so much easier if you um, do learn each other's language because when you're out and about, you can use the bubble work, you can start working um, away from the horse, working his transitions, keeping his straightness, improving his turns, and um, even just thinking about using the bubble work in and out when you lead him in and out the field. Sometimes people spend 10, 15 minutes leading their horses around every day. So if you can actually use it productively rather than just dragging them in and out the field, you've actually done groundwork. And um, the, the, your horse will learn to stay in his own space, be aware of where he is and be much more pleasant to be with. 
So let's just do a little bit of a, a quick run through some poll work that you can do. Now, I know somebody's going to say, my horse would take the red route. Most horses don't want to use one more calorie than absolutely necessary. So most horses would take the green route. And I use this as um, a therapy process. And a, um, so is that if I set up the poles, so the horse um, is, will take the easiest route, then very often I can achieve the movements that I want that horse to learn um, and to practice. So let's look at just a few exercises. This one's called the hog's back. My job as a handler is to stand in the middle um, and to make sure he keeps walking. This is a good, it's, it, um, and I'm using my stick to um, think about whether he needs to lift his um, tummy up and stay on the bend or whether he needs to keep his shoulders out and not fall in through his shoulders. And that's my only job. I'm only looking at keeping him straight on the circle and keeping him in walk. His job is to decide to lift up his feet, decide what stride he's going to hit these poles on as he's coming round and, and going over the poles. And I'm only using the two poles because I want him to learn how to adjust his stride and hit these poles on the correct on the correct stride. So this is quite a nice one that can be done on both reins. And these exercises are done in walk and they're actually mechanically very easy for the horse to do. But if he's finding it very difficult, then if he's stiff and he, he thinks it, it's gonna be difficult, then what he'll do is he'll make it himself come over the lower end of the pole. The higher end of the pole just encourages him to lift his inside abdominals. So as he's got space for his inside hind leg to come through, the limbs on the inside go through a high and short arc and the limbs on the outside go through a long and low arc. Moving on, this is um, a slalom. So you would go backward, back and forward, again, using the bubble work so that he's working in his own space. This exercise, where, where the hog's back is just on one rein in its circle, this exercise is looking at change of direction with the horse. So this would be akin to and getting him ready for things like serpent timing, loops, and even into three and four time changes as well. It's the same movement and changing direction. He's also having to work his, his limbs through um, diagonal range. And so only he's working um, through weight bearing through his diagonal ranges and therefore, um, and also the, the, the range of motion. So he is again thinking about working limbs diagonally, which is going to be a start for your um, lateral work. A couple of minutes, Joe. Then the straight, um, the straight line poles, these are actually the most difficult because the horse has to change his orientation of his rein every, every stride. So don't start with straight line poles, start with one pole on the ground and then go on to the, to the hog's back um, uh, exercise because that really is the easiest one to get the horse um, going. Then trying to go on to trot and the faster, faster paces. With the faster paces, you'll improve the stamina, you'll improve the strength, but you'll also improve, um, increase the concussion. So if you increase the concussion, obviously you've got to be very careful if you have a horse with an injury and you can build them up. This one, obviously he's thinking about where his limbs in space. You can see that, um, that outside hind leg lifting up far higher than he needs to, but he's just learning about his um, body in space here and learning, learning to keep a rhythm. And he's got his tack on here because this little horse was um, very adverse to tack and girthing at the time. And you can see here we've raised outside poles. Now he's quite clever. He said this is quite difficult. So I'm just going to go like a motorbike around these poles. So unless you have um, control of the inside abdominals for these raised poles on the outside, then this you would probably be better to do this, which is the second and fourth pole up on the inside. And that... Um, 
it's going to encourage them to stay straight. And although that looks like a mix match of a load of poles, then if you look at the height of the poles through the middle, it's actually quite low. So mechanically, there's very little stress with that. So once you've done your poles, you can start adding in, you can mix and match these sort of easy exercises. You don't need to have 40 colored poles in a lovely, um, in a lovely um, pattern. Um, you can if you want, but you can get by with two or three poles using transitions before the poles and after the poles, and then introducing work on the slope. When your horses go back and are in work where they are using speed and they're jumping, they use what we call eccentric muscle um, to uh, work. And that means that they, they have to stabilize the joints whilst the, the muscles lengthen. Now, speed, jumping and slopes are where you train that. So when you can um, do your pole work on the flat, you can progress to doing your pole work on slopes using transitions before and after. So you could walk down over these poles, do a transition to trot at the bottom of the slope, trot up the slope, do a transition from um, trot to walk at the top, walk back down over the poles. So that's a whistle stop tour through pole work. There's loads we could do on that, but one, so just give you an idea of what we can do. So what about groundwork? What about can you do any harm? You can do harm if you over challenge the horse. You're better to under challenge them and go back the next day and do a bit more. Um, if you over challenge him, either because he's not educationally ready to ask what you, you are asking him to do, or whether you've got um, tack, which is restricting his movement and making him adopt movement patterns that he is not capable of doing, or you overload him, you're going to ask for that inefficient movement, you're going to put pressure on different structures which will create tension, make him more difficult to handle and could end up causing him injury. And last but not least, how do you know that you're actually done everything right? Well, basically, if he's easy to handle, if he's finding the challenges that you're giving him easy, if he is easier to ride, you're trying to use the same language from when you're leading him about to when you're doing bubble work to when you're lunging, when you're long reining, all the way through to ridden work. And if so, if he's finding everything that you're doing easy and he's understanding, then you are doing it right. So always try and communicate calmly with them, try and communicate clearly with them and consistently with them all the way from moving them over in the stable to your high level competition and set them up to achieve. And that's all really that I think I can fit in at the moment. <laughs> Joe, thank you. That was brilliant. And uh, normally I'm, at this stage, I'm telling people, please go, start asking some questions. I don't have to do that tonight because there's lots of questions. So Joe, thank you. As you say, we didn't quite get onto Capriole, may, um, but, uh, we, <laughs> but you covered a huge amount of ground in that short time. So thank you. I just thought I'd mention, um, we, we, meant, we asked people where people were from this evening and we've got, I mean, we've got so many people joining us. A, we've got them from all over the, the, the UK, which is lovely to see, including Fiona in Scottish Borders, where she says it's very muddy. Fiona, I can assure you it's very muddy in many other parts of the country, according to, and then of course all over Europe, from Croatia, Germany, Ireland, Cyprus, Finland, Sweden, Spain, Netherlands, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Denmark and Greece, and then we've got the USA, Canada and South Africa. But most important of all, we've got Judith from South Bucks, who says she has, Joe, your joined up rehab DVD, which she's had for years, and she says is absolutely brilliant. So there you go. Uh, so Joe, thank you. We'll be coming back to you for questions shortly. Now for the next, um, before I move on to introduce Eileen, we're going to do our next poll question, which is um, if you currently use or plan to use groundwork with a horse, what is the main reason? And this time we have given you a number of options, rider unfit or injured, rider short of time, saddle doesn't fit, rehabilitation of horse after injury, all round development and strengthening of the horse, or another reason. 
So whilst you're thinking about that, it gives me great pleasure uh, as I'm going to share my screen again to introduce you to Eileen. Sorry, there is the question um, for those of you. If you're currently planning to use Groundwork, what's the main reason? There, there, there's the question up for you. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Eileen, who I've already said is our um Farm Centre Manager for our Scottish Re, uh, Rescue and Rehoming Centre, and she's had a lifetime of working with horses in all from stud work to young horses, uh, horses and racing and show jumping, eventing and dressage. But she, her great love is bringing on young competition horses, and that's where she she really did excel. She is. Um, uh, also a centre manager for Wells Horse Welfare for over 30 years. She um, is the one and only centre manager for Bellwade Farm in Aberdeenshire for Wells Horse Welfare, uh, which she's set up um, and ha has seen flourish over the last th 30 plus years um, from, from 1990. But I mean, it's not all she, she seems, because as well as spending a lot of time people teaching people how to stay on horses, she's also taught them how to s fall off them because she spent time uh, teaching stunt riders to fall off safely which of course is very important if you're a stunt rider and she wants to stress that she never harmed a horse or human whilst doing it so before i hand over to eileen um basil can you give us the answer to the poll question look at that three quarters all round development and strengthening of the horse that's brilliant um and certainly um i hope therefore that what joe has said and what eileen is going to say and the, the q a is going to be really really um helpful to you so without further ado eileen over to you just need to unmute yourself eileen Are you okay? You're still muted. What? No, you're st you put yourself back on mute again. Try again. That's right. it. Done that. All right, I'm away. Okay. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to very snowy Bellwade uh, up here in the northeast of Scotland. Eileen, you just okay. You uh, on the presentation view, you're you're on. My mouse is not working. From beginning. There we go. There we go. Are we ready? Good job. All right. We also have amazing broadband speeds up here. So uh, please excuse me. Okay. Um, just to maybe just start a wee bit quick, uh, quickly. Um, Joe and I have had an association for nearly the 30 years that I've been uh, with World Horse Welfare. So an awful lot that Joe's already said, I will probably be recapping. So um, if you it, if it is a bit of repeat, then I apologise. But it's never uh, you can never say enough about the basics. Okay, so building strength through groundwork. Now, when do we actually start this? Now, nature, Mother Nature, has already started this. They're learning from the first chapter of life. As soon as they come out the womb, they are learning to stand on four feet. Some are a bit wobblier than others, but in a very short period of time, they're already learning that to be able to stretch down to the grass is really quite useful. And as you can see from this poll, it is already taking off a great stance, quite comical, but actually it tells you an awful lot about the fall itself. Looking at the hind feet, it's right behind it, it's already um, incentive of being able to flee because they are animals of flight where, if and when it is necessary. So in all, it's all a new adventure. Now I will say that, you know, uh, Bowie Farm is one of four farms of rehabilitation. We never know what sort of horse, pony or donkey will come into our care at any one time. Now to say that we are lucky at some point to see the falls at the start of the life, but we also will maybe come across 12 year old mares that have had fall after fall and never been handled. So where we come start from the rehab work uh, to what we see in the rescue and rehabilitation centers is that we start building blocks. 
We're fortunate last year that we actually had about 12 foals born. And this gave our staff a great opportunity to be able to start foals life right from the start. This was, um, it's all a new adventure for the foals. These two uh, here are just last year's foal born uh, around May time. They have been weaned. It was very successful without any problems. And they were quite happy to accept human interaction at a very early stage. Now, remembering that our foals, even at this groundwork level, are going to be caught. They're going to have halters put on them. They're going to be taught how to be led. We lead them from both sides, so we're keeping them balanced right from the start. We're also bringing in um, things like picking up their feet independently. As you see on the right-hand side in the photograph, this uh, nearly yearling is actually actually is trying to establish a good stance to be able to pick up one foot. This is all a learning curve. The handler is always being positive. It's always a positive reaction. If there's any negativity, then we, look, we go back a stage till we get that positive uh, reaction. Nothing at all that is counteractive. So therefore start the way you mean to go on. All positive thoughts. Horses at any time of life are habitual and what you do on a repetitive scale will always stand them in good stead and also for you as the handler. Now, before we go on any further, I'd just like to bring back, now this is a wonderful diagram that is available on the internet. Uh, you can download this. I look at this quite a lot actually, just to remind myself even after over 40 years of, of uh, horsemanship um just look at how the horse develops and skeletally now there is a thing called uh, open joints now a horse has many joints in its body just like you and me and as we mature in age those joints what they call close up now to for want of this presentation i'm going to just use the word mature now as you can see the color coded here from birth, the feet is the first thing to start maturing. Now, as horse people, you will know that the farrier, um, if you had see a foal that had an, an issue with its feet, you have a very limited time. And the sooner that your farrier is able to get and establish good foot contact, and I will come back to this later, then the better. So without going through too much veterinary stuff, I'm just going to keep this quite simple. But as you can go with the color coordination, when we're looking at the horse's spine, the place that we're going to be placing the saddle eventually, or the driving harness, or the pack saddle, or whatever sort of accoutrement you're going to be using that horse for, um, then you will see that the purple color here is the last uh, structure that actually matures, and that's the spine. Very, very important part, but also takes a long time to mature. At this stage, I will also mention, and it's something that uh, a lot of people don't realize, is that we look at the blue part, the dark blue part in the horse's head is actually the, jaw, the lower jawbone. So this is also a major uh, structure that we need to keep an eye on. Right. Just keep it in the back of your head because what we also have to think about, um, you know, I will say uh, the horse hasn't quickened up in evolution, okay? It is what it is. But six years seems to be a long time to wait, doesn't it? So we not, normally we look at maybe a horse that's three, three and a half years of age. It does depend on the breed, it does depend on the height of the horse. The higher the horse, uh, when you're starting to look at over 16 hands, the longer it takes to mature. It is what it is. So you have to think about the way forward for this. Now, we at, uh, in our rehab centers, we tend to use the lunging and long reining and pole work, which Joe has so kindly introduced at a very early age uh, of rehabilitation uh, at, at the farms. But we look at what we're trying to achieve here. Um, 
there is a great structure called the musculoskeletal system to be able to get the younger horse being able to do a job and fit for purpose then we as the trainer needs to be looking at how we're developing the horse to give it the best possible chance in life now we use do we do use the lunging method and i will say at this point lunging some people there's some myths going around and some not uh, people that do not understand lunging is done in a circle at least a 15 meter circle not an eight meter circle not a 10 meter circle your lunge lines are between 20 and 25 meters long they're that long for a reason anything done under 15 meters actually can do irreparable damage not to the young, not just to the young horse but to the uh, because it will not be able to balance itself. And Joel, as, as you said, balance is the key thing and being able to utilize its whole body structure and be able to build on good muscle that's going to be able to support that post until it's about six years of age. Um, as we're doing this, uh, we're, uh, the, the handler is always able to see what is going on there. It's always quite useful to have a, uh, another pair of eyes. If you're not quite sure about how to lunch, go and get some lessons. There are a lot of people out there. You just have to ask the question before you start your young horse. But whatever you're going to teach that horse for the future, it look at it as building blocks. If you're getting to a stage that you're not, your communication is not happening with the horse, go back a step to where it you did have good communication and learn from that. Now, whether you're dealing with a four or five year old horse at the early start, or whether you're starting off a 12 year old youngster that's never been handled, as our staff do very uh, more often than not, then the basic blocks are still the same. Start where you want to go on, do short sessions, learn, 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 learn what your horse is telling you and also your horse learn from you if you've got a good attitude good positive confident attitude all the way through if in doubt ask for help ask for the correct help look for the qualifications from the people that can actually help you everybody's an expert but not always the right expertise so how are we doing on this uh we're hopefully got you know, the commands by the voice, the going forward, the rhythm, the tempo, the horse is learning how to balance. Joe loves that bit. It's also learning to carry itself. Now the horse knows how to hold the horse's head up. I was always trained the horse's head or your reins, I should say, belong to the horse, not you. You will not be able to hold the horse's head up through any gate or whatever. And you're only going to end up with great big biceps and a, a, a challenging ride all the time. So why do it? Leave the horse to hold its own head up. Your body sitting in the saddle with balance should also be able to uh, control what the horse and what you're actually uh, want to achieve. Uh, the other little bit of groundwork uh, inspiration there is don't ask the horse to do anything in the saddle that you haven't already asked on the ground. Groundwork is fascinating. Lunging is not uh, boring at all. Lunging, when you're thinking about it, it's a 50 meter circle at least, it's four points in the circle, ride a 20 meter circle and use those four points. It is actually quite challenging, but teaching your horse how to go around on the lunge or in the long range on a 50 meter circle, looking for those points, make your, does actually make your life a little bit easier when you want to do that dressage test in your 20 by 40 arena. The self carriage will also, uh, there will cause the straightness. It, it really helps when you're actually wanting to teach the aids on the ground and the aids will be as simple when you're aboard. Now, at this point, I will have to mention that it's no foot, no horse. Now, your farrier, who will be the person, he or she, will probably be, and hopefully, will be the person that is going through your youngster's journey, right from an early start. 
As I mentioned before, if there's any food problems at the, as a whole, then the farrier is the person to ask for help for, as, along with your vet. As you can see on the left-hand side, I would hope that you think that this foot is overgrown and unbalanced. This is the same foot on the right-hand side after successful trimming. The point with this, and we could go into a separate webinar about hoofs and, and trimming and, and shoeing, but for this uh, time tonight, look at the difference. If you're leaving your sessions between farrier sessions and uh, foot, good foot trimming and balance is being too long, then you're asking for problems. I hope you can see that this horse is actually adapted a different stance on the left to what he is corrected to on the right. Couple of obviously, okay, obviously uh, a good pair would be very useful to start off with. Again, farriers. Saddles, accoutrements, please. There's lots of different types out there. There's pack saddles, there's western saddles, there's um, endurance saddles, there's uh, saddles with no trees whatsoever. At the end of the day, the saddle, and I will mention the bridle, and that's remembering that last, our second last joint to think, it must fit. The days of bringing out the old saddle, that, oh, well, we don't ride in it, but it's okay for our backing or braking, I use that term lightly, or introducing side reins, long reins, whatever, then think again, the saddle must fit. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, it's going to cause issues. The horse on the right, this horse has had issues. Whether this horse has had saddle problems, which I'm 99% sure it has, because if you look at it, there's no muscle formation whatsoever. It is there. Don't just say it's an old thoroughbred. Don't, it happens in every breed. It could also happen, these uh, the white hair telltale signs, it could also come from badly fitting rugs. So, and people piling on the rugs because it's a thin skinned horse. Think about rug fitting, because when, even that simple thing of putting a rug on <clears throat> and it doesn't fit can actually have detrimental effects when you're trying to fit a saddle. There's many decent saddle fitters out there. They're qualified, they're highly trained. Ask, look for them. You're on the internet, look for a good saddle fitter. You'll say, say the same thing for bridles or any other bits of equipment that you might reach out for. As far as the mouth is concerned, then think about it before you start looking for a nose band that tightens around and stops the horse's mouth from opening or any other bits that you think might be a quick means to an end. As long as it fits and as long as you're trained to use it, perfect. If not, don't do it. Highly now, I'm running out of time. Um, just take two seconds on this, just to give you an idea of what we do. Isla, um, deemed unsuitable for one discipline. You can see from the slide there, you can look back to it. He came in five, year, five six year old, lame behind, uh, poor foot balance in front, we rehome our horses on our rehoming scheme. We're very lucky to rehome this particular horse to a very experienced uh, groundwork um, trainer. And to say that this horse turned from a non-suitable athletic career to somebody, our horse that ended up um, competing at the World Equestrian Games last time around and to have an absolute balance, perfect balance, perfect outline, perfect tempo for the gymnast to be able to hold that stance for a certain amount of time just shows you groundwork can be exciting. Thank you very much. Eileen, thank you. And what an inspirational case example. Um, um, I'm not sure if it's true, but I think Isla was next to uh, Zara Phillips Toy Town at um, the 2002 World Equestrian Games in her ref, um, which was lovely because our president, the Prince, uh, Royal Highness Princess Royal, uh, went to see Toy Town and managed to see Isla at the same time. It was lovely. Brilliant. Now, um, imagine we, we're clearly, we've got a lot of people listening from Scotland. So we are at the bottom of Ben Nevis looking up because there are a, a shed load of questions 
questions, if that's the director. So Eileen and Joe, if you can keep your answers as tight as possible, um, that would be brilliant. So to get us going, um, Joe, when you were doing groundwork with the horse, is it better for him to be wearing all the tack he normally wears when he is ridden? Yeah. Um, it, I think yes, with the exception of I, I would actually put his saddle on, etc. Get him used to having his tack on, being confident with that. But one of the things I usually use is just the cavison. So probably wouldn't work off the bit. I would probably I find I get more control and I can do more with just a cavison and, and a, a lunge ring. Brilliant. So yeah, but I'm quite happy for him to use it. Brilliant. I think we're going to come back to that as well. Um, d d um, Eileen, if a horse is solely doing in-hand walk work, how many miles would you recommend as optimal? Um, well, depending on why you're doing that. Is it because of injury? Sorry, I didn't quite get the whole question. Um, and how long can you walk for? I mean, your horse can uh, cover quite a lot of acreage uh, or miles in its field, if that is the case. If it's, if it's at, after injury, then it's a little bit every day increasing the amount that you're doing in minutes. Remembering your, um, it's not just a walk, it's not a stroll. If you're going to go for a walk, walk. Yeah. You know, yeah. get that tempo going, get that heartbeat going. Excellent. So Thank you. <laughs> Good. Joe, um, what's the best exercise to improve top line for a horse with kicking spines and osteoarthritis? I think the main thing I find with um, horses recovering from for kissing spine is that you want to get the muscles on either side of his back moving reciprocally, so one side and then the other side, and that tends to keep him as good as possible for as long as possible. So really the exercise that I showed you, which is the hog's back exercise, and then the changing direction, um, so the hog's back on each rein and then the, the slalom so that his muscles are working one side, then the other, and then progressing through to the straight line um, pole work. I think it's just very basic stuff, but get the, get the muscles working rhythmically across his back. And so hog's back, slalom, then straight lines. Brilliant. And just a rider to that, Barbara's asked, would you call the hog, hog's back an easy exercise for an older arthritic pony who's been out of work for two months? It is an easier, easy exercise for them because they, um, to make it even easier, you can pull the poles apart so you do it on an even bigger circle. So if the horse, if, if you find that he's struggling with it and by struggling, a really good way of telling if they're struggling or not is that um, they hit the poles of the wrong stride. Horses that find this easy hit the poles on the right stride, just like show jumpers hit the poles on the right stride with a nice canter. So, but if he is finding it difficult, pull the poles apart and do it on a bigger circle. Brilliant. Um, Eileen Jane's asked, my horse is doing a no self-exercise in the field with this foul weather, but a very jolly when we take him in. When we go to restart riding, so obviously out of grass, and how do we get rid of the steam out of them other than lunge if they won't exercise, self-exercise? Right, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, if you're not um, doing much, I would actually look at how much you're actually feeding your concentrates. Have you reduced the amount of feed or hard, you know, that you would have been using if you had been riding it? So reduce your amount for that. Now we've got the same issue here. We're covered with snow and ice, and. Uh, yeah, horses are having a great difficulty trying to move about it, but there is energy going out. So reduce your amount of, of food intake, not your fiber, your high calorie stuff. And then, yeah, pick your choice. If you, lunging can be difficult, but even just, if you can, actually just leave school. Let them get off, let off steam that way. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Absolutely. It will get better. yeah, can I just cut in on this one? Because it, it relates to what I was saying about make the horse work from the beginning of his treat uh, for his session. Is that if you really decide that he has to gallop round and round in circles, then you have to be looking at your training or his health or, as Eileen just said, his management. So, you know, these sort of things. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Um, 
sorry, Maya's question. Maya's asked, Joe, um, can you explain the difference between leg movers versus back movers? And can groundwork help turn leg movers into back movers? <laughs> yeah, I think leg movers are horses that don't move the back properly. So um, absolutely, the very basic exercises, I'm going to be very boring, go back to saying hogs back slalom, yeah. um, straight lines. You can make these exercises more elaborate, which we didn't have time. You know, I did a three day course for physiotherapists on different setups for different things. You can make it more elaborate, but these three basic exercises will, will help, help with that. And looking at the posture, go back and have a look and see what we said about posture. So if you've got a herring gutted horse, think more about the lateral bend and a sway back horse, think more about getting them to come up and go long and low. Brilliant. Um, Eileen, Louise has asked, I don't have access to an arena or an arena to lunge. How can I make sure I get the best out of groundwork? Oh, you know, um, groundwork doesn't always have to include coloured poles and bumpkins or bumpkins or whatever you like to call it. You know, go for a walk. Go around, you know, if you're, you know, if you've got country lanes and you've got access to bridleways, lead them out. Introduce them to stepping over, broken, you know, falling down trees, things like that. Um, you will take your dog for a walk, take your horse for a walk. I know it sounds, oh, well, what, what's the point? But it is actually keeping their mental attitude correct. And also, again, as my previous answer, if it's a walk, it's not a stroll. It's a walk. I mean it. You know, you get... Um, yeah, not everybody's got a wonderful menage. And your point there, Eileen, about using the natural, I mean, I know, you know, curbs, you can step, stepping up and down so, uh, uh, curbs, I mean, you, could, you can improvise, can't you? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Um, Joe, um, Innes has asked a very interesting, do you have any experience in re rehabilitating old suspensory ligament desmitis? So old suspensory ligament issues, and if so, how much improvement can you expect to see in such cases? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like any pathology, While the, from the physio point of view or from the groundwork point of view, it's getting the whole body movement correct, because if you get the whole body movement correct, it takes the pressure off the area of pathology. Yeah. So yes, you'll have had lots of treatment for that particular area, whether it's veterinary or physio or electrotherapy or whatever. But one of the big things that we've always done through um, rehabilitation of all of these horses with pathology is you look at the whole body and the more efficiently the whole body moves, the less pressure is on that. Yeah pathology and therefore you're more likely to get more function from these it's a long a long big 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 subject yeah. but that would be the, the best tip get look at the whole body movement brilliant and build it up obviously slowly absolutely um, build it up. yeah and 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 keep keep the walk the walk will improve your movement patterns through your muscle patterns yeah. So do a lot of muscle pattern stuff in walk, which is a very low concussive force on the injuries. And therefore, you know, get your movement patterns going walk before you introduce the more concussion trot work. Brilliant. Uh, the questions are still coming in quicker than we're answering them. So um, uh, Eileen, Eleanor's asked, at what age should you start groundwork? Oh, groundwork, as I said, from the beginning. Um, to be honest, you don't, you know, groundwork is not just, you know, serious working and, and in the aim for riding. Groundwork is starting from the beginning, though, as soon as you, I mean, okay, not everybody has a fall from the start, but if you're buying a youngster, a two, three year old, go back, look at the groundwork that you think uh, that fall has been learned, teach, uh, taught, I should say, getting tongue tied. And in a lot of cases, people are, you know, they're second hand, they're bought, they're a youngster or their six year old has maybe done something. What you think is what level they might be at because, oh yes, I can ride it away or it's really good over poles or it's really good over a jump. And then you bring it home. So many times you hear somebody's bought the horse and it's not what they thought. Yeah. But actually it's what the person who started them off might have a slightly different idea of where you're thinking are. So there's the building block. Go back to basics. Start 
Me want to go on. Okay, I'm going to um, next one for Joe uh, from Laura. Any tips for lateral work in hand? Yeah, do the slalom work and make a uh, um, tunnel of poles. So make like a diamond with your poles. So you've got three poles in the middle, two poles out about a meter from that there, and then I go out and another meter from the side, and then walk diagonally across across your diagonal. And you can walk diagonally across your diamond or you can walk over two poles and then go straight so you can work on your transitions in and out of lateral work as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Um, Eileen, Becky's asked, how much should you use your voice when doing bubble work? Would it be the same as when you lunge? Oh, I would say yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, use the, the same, the same ca calm, consistent um, language you would when you're in the stable, moving them across, to when you're doing bubble work, to when you're doing lunging work, and then eventually ridden work, and then you can shut up and just ride your horse after uh, as a progression to that. Brilliant. And just as a rider, that Sandra's asked, what length pole, uh, what length stick would you use when you you when you do bubble work? I usually try and walk about a meter and a half, two meters away from the horse. So I use a back to front um, lunge stick, quite often the old ones that the tails have fallen off. And because they bounce in your hand and you can get them to bounce in the rhythm of the horse's walk without you having to use your wrists too much. So yeah, and, and if the horse is really difficult to handle, you maybe need to be a little bit closer. So you maybe just want to use a schooling stick. Um, brilliant. Um, Eileen, Chloe's asked, are there any exercises you shouldn't do with a youngster? Oh, um, exercises. Well, I wouldn't be... There's the one thing that I don't like doing, and I would advocate, is, is if you're going to lunge, do not canter. Do not canter them. Uh, it's totally unbalancing them. It's actually uh, counterproductive. Um... Asking too much of them too soon. Uh, I think uh, the, the last photograph that Joe put up of possibly a youngster jumping out of his skin, that's too much. Yeah, it looks, yeah. oh wow, by that horse. But actually, how long is that horse going to last? Yeah. So, baby steps, build the blocks, and that's it. Brilliant. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, uh, Kirsty and Emma, related questions. Kirsty's asked, are there any, any lunging aids you would actually recommend? Uh, but Emma, I love Emma's question. How do you encourage enthusiasm when lunging? My horse looks like he's laughing at me. Also, no response to the stick, however much I make myself look silly, which I loved. <laughs> <laughs> what one do you want to answer first? Can I, I'll answer the last one, yeah. the second one. I think you need to have as much energy. Um, if the horse is really... Um, excited you have to just take a chill pill yourself and breathe and, and go into your quiet place if the horse is um, really lazy and doesn't want to lunge then you have to be uber uber um, energetic when you stand in the middle in your in your way you are but also if he really doesn't want to lunge i would certainly be thinking is he capable of of doing it or has he just done it so much he's so bored and if he's bored do something else transitions poles all the other things brilliant um there's another one for you joe uh, i think george has asked any good books or resources with inventive pole work exercises that you would recommend there are absolutely loads um, and it's a very sexy topic at the moment it's pole work and we see all sorts of wonderful things there's um, I think the phys exercise physio on Facebook does quite nice ones but there is a difference between the pole work I've shown you today and the the lovely sort of big patterns of poles all over. I think the, these ones are more toward training and rhythm and straightness, whereas my ones are probably going back a step and you're looking at actually improving the movement patterns with them. So you can try my DVD. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Good spot. Um, um, Abby's asked Eileen, there's a few people have asked about PSD, proximal suspensory dysmitis. Any useful tips or stretches? She's got a, a, ch a challenge with one that's um, 
as nine months, he's still two tenths lame, and I'm trying to find everything possible to help him. Groundwork has certainly increased his position and strength, and is more now more sound than lame. Any tips that we could give Abby? I think that's really one for Joe. Okay. Um, okay, um, we're talking about hind limb props. Yeah. yeah. Um, the quadrant stretches are really nice, which is just getting him to stand with one leg in front of the other. Um, behind and then one leg behind the other and then when he's confident with that and you're doing that nicely then getting him to step over so he stands with one leg in front of the other and then you walk him off his first the first stride at a 90 degree angle in one direction and then the other and really that gets him used to using his limbs through a diagonal pattern without putting an awful lot of pressure on the on the actual injury um, I would be very careful about the ground you work them on. So trying to work them on firmer ground that's not slippy. As soon as you put these guys in the deep ground, they lose their stability and then they're putting more pressure on their, um, on their pathology or the weak area. And going back to the other question, you do work on the whole body patterning rather than thinking about too much about the local area. Brilliant. Joe, thank you. And that, that a number of people have asked about that. So I, I, I'll, I'll move over those questions. Um, Eileen, um, Maddie has asked, what groundwork exercises would be beneficial for a spooky horse? <laughs> a spooky horse. OK, well, why is it spooking? Is it actually listening to you as the handler or is he paying attention elsewhere that he's spooking? So I think going back to a little bit more basic groundwork and actually g gaining the horse's attention and also his trust that actually he should be listening to you um, rather than looking what's further in the next uh, second field away or down the street and uh, doing something else. So I think it's actually gaining a little bit more attention from you. It is a, it is a, a, a it's a, it is a good relationship that you're looking for. A spookiness, he's not listening to you. Get him to listen, all right? And that is, you know, as Joe says, his bubble work, his leading, making sure that everything that you're doing is a positive reaction and that he's actually looking for the next stage. Yeah. If he's taking his attention away, give him something else to do. Brilliant. The other thing about that really is that very often with the horses I've had in for rehab, they spook and they spook because they've got a problem. It's a sign that they're really that they're really struggling. So don't underestimate that rather than just being a naughty horse. Absolutely. There is no such thing as a naughty horse. Um, <laughs> um, Joe, Karen's asked, all, all your work looked to be in a caverson. When or if would you work from the bit? Um, when I want to, probably if I wanted to take him out long, long reining, um, I would probably work from the bit. Um, so he gets used to keeping that contact, getting a contact or having a contact. But um, I think one of the relating back as well, if you don't feel confident about long reining them, then again, just just stay with the, stay with the cavison. All of the work that we do really is in the cavison because if something does happen, I really don't want to have um, the pressure on his pole and in, on his mouth. Um, most of the horses, remember, I'm treating our, uh, working with our rehab horses, so quite often incidents do happen, and I really don't want to be hanging onto the mouth to produce pain or fear or more tension, and I feel I get less, less problems. So, but the quick answer to your question is when I want to start introducing a contact with the horse, but I wouldn't lunge him. I would probably be long reining at that point and then riding. Brilliant. Now, we're, we're, we're over time, but I'm determined to get you a few more questions. So we've got to be even quicker, please, guys. Um, uh, Daisy's asked, um, uh, Eileen, my ponies field is nice and flat. So would this be a good substitute for an arena? Yes. Why not? Absolutely. Yes. Good. Go Excellent. Um, um, Joe, Con James asked, Connie has a dip back and lacking uh, abdominal strength. What can I do to lift his back? Um, bright stretches, rocking back and forward, lifting his front feet up, front foot up and rocking back and forward, hogs back slalom, straight lines. 
Brilliant. Another one for you, Joe. George has asked, best exercises for a horse of bilateral hock osteoarthritis now sound after corticoid steroid injections uh, for six months? Same answer. Good. Um, uh, um, Eileen, Terry's asked on Facebook, my lad is very much on the forehand and stubborn. Which poles would help him? Uh, could be less that is more. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Over to you, Joe. <laughs> uh, try, try some bribe stretching to get him to come up through his um, rib cage. So diagonal bribe stretching. <laughs> Brilliant. Joe, a quick one. So Julie's just asked for a little bit more information about the bubble, please. Uh yeah, the 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 bubble really need more. Well, the bubble is just so that he you can be in your bubble. Horse can be in his bubble. The stick that you're using to extend your bubble um, can makes the bubble go in front of him, which will slow him down. Makes him go to the side of him, which pushes him away. Goes behind him, which pushes him forward. And um, the stick shouldn't touch him. Actually, I, I need to say this. The stick shouldn't be used as a weapon. If he moves away from the end of the stick, therefore out with your bubble, that stick shouldn't touch him. It should be merely there as a prompt for him to see where you want him to move. And in that way, you can um, improve his movement pattern. Brilliant. Thank you. Daisy's actually 11 years old. She says, I don't have an arena because I mainly ride out on a hack where I can do some groundwork with my horse. Great point. Um, Eileen, Florence has asked, when trying to teach a horse something new, is it a good idea if they're particularly food orientated to use food as a positive, re for positive reinforcement? It can be, yes, yes. I mean, it's, uh, if you're looking at the likes of trick training or anything else like that, and there's a positive thing at the end of it, then yes, go for it. But remember, it is just a little treat. It's not a bucket. It's not a carrot. Because horses are very quick at learning if they do 10 things right, that's 10 carrots. Maybe not conducive to our overweight. Yes, the timing of that treat is, is, is really important. It's a good question. Um, what exercises would you recommend, Joe, for a rising two-year-old with locking stifles? Um, st actually, straight lines. Straight lines and keep them, it's more the surface, keep them on the harder surface. So if you can walk them on um, turf or something like that, it's probably better than a deep arena or muddy ground. So, um, and what and stepping over poles, but the he, he would be one of the ones that I would keep off the circle and I would not lunge to start with. I would keep get him out and about long raining. And if you're not confident to long rain, walk him out doing bubble work. Brilliant. Um, Eileen, Louise has asked, at what age would you suggest start lunging or longlining a young horse, a, an Arab in this case? It does depend on the actual horse itself. There's no hard and fast rule. But I wouldn't be starting to look at doing that sort of groundwork, circle work, really, um, till well after three, three and a half years of age. Brilliant. Um, uh, d d Joe, uh, Louise has asked, what voice commands would you recommend for lunging? Um, I use whoa and whoa, walk on, trot, and I do canter, but I canter in big, big circles, Eileen, and canter. But I usually just use whoa. But what is important is that you use the cons it consistently. So if you get the bubble work going, and then you you use wool and walk on for that, then I think then you can use the same thing for lunging and you're halfway there. And Eileen, last question. Kira's asked, do you think it's too late to retrain a 19-year-old? Never too late. Absolutely. She has also asked, where do you start? And I guess, I mean, <laughs> is there anything different in terms of retraining a 19-year-old to a four-year-old? Yeah, 19 year olds um, are usually not here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all, yeah, it's all a new experience if that's the case. And the thing about it is 
find out what they do know and you might get surprised <laughs> yes. at what they can do. Listen, thank you. Uh, the machine tells me we've answered 30 questions, but there are still 49 to answer. I'm very sorry we haven't got through to all the questions. I have tried to sort of get a variety and there was quite a lot of consistency in some of them. So really sorry not to get to, to all of them. Um, blimey, it's, it's, it's been a session and a half. Um, Eileen, what are your, having heard all of that, um, what are your take home thoughts? My, really my take home thoughts is, is KISS, keep it simple, build the blocks, enjoy it, look, listen and learn from your horse. If things are going wrong, he's trying to tell you something. So go back to where it was good and move forward from there. Brilliant. Joe, what, what are your final thoughts? Final thoughts on groundwork, be calm, give them time to ask him the question, give them time to absorb the question and respond. He will learn, so you're improving your com um, communication and for all things that you're doing with him, set him up to achieve. Set him up to be successful. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, listen, thank you. Uh, thank you. A, big, a huge thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and I'm just saying, reiterate my apologies for not being able to get through more questions. But a, a, a massive thank you uh, to Joe and Eileen. Blimey, what, what, what an evening. And um, you've given us so much to th and, the and, the, and the comments coming in. It, people have absolutely loved it. So thank you very much uh, to Eileen and, and especially to you, Joe, for joining us. Given the success of this evening, I'm afraid you've been so good we have to have you back again um, so, uh, that, 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 that we very much look forward to that just to say obviously tonight's been about groundwork if you've got um, any um, topics you'd like us to cover uh, then please do uh, suggest them by sending them into education at worldhorsewelfare.org our Wednesday webinars will be back in a fortnight on February the 17th when we have Pippa Funnel and Mark Todd and they will be talking to us about preparing uh, your horse for a competition for the season ahead so please do register for that and um, we've put a link in the chat box there um, and thank you again for joining us in this in this mad world we live in hopefully life is getting um, a little bit uh, brighter in so many different ways what excites me most is the fact it's getting to five o'clock in the evening at least where I am in the south of England and it's still light spring is on its way and so is our next Wednesday webinar we look forward to seeing you then in the meantime, take great care of yourselves and thank you so much.